Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making, making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, which, where we have over 300 government contracting web webinars available for download. Special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We'd also like to thank our friends at the Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work prim primarily with large, with large business, businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and software companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis, analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pressing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Rose Stern. You can find her inf contact information here. And today we're going to be covering part 35 with Rose. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thank you thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Colton, and thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, and also thanks to everyone who is joining today. I really hope you enjoy this presentation because it's a subject that I'm really interested in. I find it very fascinating. And I hope that you all gain some takeaways that'll make your companies much more successful. Again, my name is Rose Stern and I have the pleasure of practicing with 1,200 other attorneys at the McGuire Woods firm. And we have offices around the world. Uh, my primary office is in the DC area. And I've been assisting government contractors with both pro procurement contracting and financial assistance for over about 20 years now. Next slide. So where are we going? Oh, back, sorry, Colton, back one slide. Where are we going? There we go. Um, before we dive down into the details of research and development under FAR Part 35, I'd like to take just a few minutes, just a couple slides, to kind of set, level set everybody that's on the call about what is the big picture, what's available. Um, R&D government funding is available for for-profit companies, state and governmental and quasi-governmental entities, and nonprofits like research institutes or universities and hospitals, um, or education, healthcare, and social service providers. Small entities perform R&D planning each year, as well as extremely sophisticated companies. They include exploration into government funding that may offset their own pure R&D costs. In addition, some contractors include R&D procurement activities as part of their business development strategy and capture planning. So in other words, they're going to be bidding on goods and services on some of these projects. The US budget request for 2020 included overall 134 billion, a little over that number, for R&D, and this amount is lower than prior years. For a full breakdown of funding for participants who wanna see the areas and the agencies, take a look at the Congressional Report Service, FY, Federal R&D Funding Report. It's available online. Next slide. There's a lot of programs, both procurement-based on one hand, so those would be governed by the FAR, or financial assistance programs on the other hand that are used to fuel government-funded research and development. So in this slide, what you'll see is two categories, including a list of programs broken down by either FAR-based or non-FAR-based programs. And this list is by no means exhaustive, it's just the primary uh, programs and opportunities that, I've, that I see. 
we could have a separate webinar on each of these programs. And earlier this year, I provided a 60 minute presentation on OTAs, but as a really high level so that everybody on the call is level set, I'm just gonna give a real brief description of these programs. So OTAs and TIAs, DOD may issue other transaction agreements or OTAs or a technology investment agreement, TIA, for research and development projects. An OTA agreement is just quite frankly um, an agreement that doesn't fit between the definition of a contract versus a grant or cooperative agreement. So the real focus of OTAs is to provide the government and the contractor needed flexibility to negotiate required terms. And the agreement might be direct between the government and the contractor or through a consortium. TIAs um, are typically used to carry out really basic applied and advanced research performed by a for-profit contractor or consortium that includes a for-profit contractor. And TIAs are used to develop commercial technologies and ultimately DOD will want to use or negotiate rights in that technology for its own purpose. TIAs are designed to encourage collaboration between the government and commercial companies. And they're essentially provide DOD access to leading edge commercial innovation it, it otherwise might not have access to. So you'll see um, as we go through this, a common theme here in, you know, one thing to look at if you've only done procurement contracting, when you're looking at R&D contracting, the relationship between the contractor and the government is much, much less confrontational and more about collaboration. So cooperative research and development agreements or CRADAs generally provide non-monetary resources like the use of government facilities or government intellectual property and expertise. And it allows joint research and development between the government and national laboratories. The goal is to create useful technologies and marketable products. Rules governing CRADAs are published by the awarding entity. The SBA, the Small Business Administration, also has a small business innovation research program called CIBR and a small business technology transfer program called CITR. They fund small business research and development that may include um, a very nice phase three commercialization of the resultant technology. Next slide. Another way to generally categorize available programs is contracts versus ag agreements. So generally when you see contract, um, you'll know, um, the, you know what you're dealing with versus an agreement. And so you know, sometimes you see those words used interchangeably, but there is a distinction. So at a really high level, contracts are used only when the principal purpose is the acquisition of goods or services for the direct benefit or use by the federal government, whereas grants or cooperative agreements are used when the principal purpose of the transaction is to stimulate or support research and development for another public purpose. So comparing these two categories, unlike the purpose of a grant or cooperative agreement, procurement contracts are used, like I said, to procure goods and services that directly benefit the government as opposed to some public other or other purpose. <clears throat> um, just a, a few bullet points about, <clears throat> um, a few bullet points, procurement contracts are primarily governed by the FAR. Other agencies like SBA, DOD, and NASA also issue additional or supplemental regulations and they um, are, are found all on the government websites and you probably use them on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also many types of procurement contracts that include firm fixed price, cost, or even letter contracts. And the FAR terms that I was just talking about flow down. So in other words, some of those terms must be in lower tiered contracts. <clears throat> on the other hand, <clears throat> in looking at non-procurement agreements, Grants and cooperative agreements taken together are just one form of at least 15 categories of federal assistance and recipients are largely government or quasi-governmental entities and nonprofits, again, including research institutes, universities, 
<clears throat> and hospital health care and social service providers. Grants or cooperative agreements are used by the government to transfer funding to a recipient to support research that addresses a public need. Neither of these is subject to the FAR or FAR supplement. Instead, separate regulations apply. And that's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to go over these because the FAR is really a jumping off point for this area. So for example, uniform guidance dictates compliance on grant projects and agencies might augment the uniform guidance with additional regulations. So based on regulations and controlling guidance, for-profit entities, so for our for-profit contractors on the call, they're often used as lower tier contractors and vendors, <clears throat> but they are also allowed to be direct recipients under certain agency programs. And, that, and you can find that by regulation. Recipients receive funding for R&D costs, but unlike procurement contracts, grants provide typically no profit or fee to the recipient, but the entity shares rights in the resultant technology or research. So this is basically, this, this right to the technology is basically the compensation. Uh, you know, of course there are costs that are part of the award, but in, in terms of the fee associated with it, the compensation is really the resultant technology use. All of that being said, I just want to reiterate for those vendors and contractors on the call, um, they supply only goods and services as opposed to the IT or um, intellectual property, um, and they may receive profit on their contracts for goods and services. So what's the primary difference, you might be asking, between a grant and a cooperative agreement? They really might sound the same. Well, grants are often used when the recipient is largely independent in the research effort. And on the other hand, cooperative agreements are usually selected where the government expects to be significantly involved in executing the project. Key entities you might wanna take a look at for R&D opportunities are DOD, DOE, NIH, and NASA. So now that we have this background on you know, what the big picture looks like in terms of research and, and development funding, we're going to focus a little bit more on the first category contracts of R&D opportunities. Next slide. So going along with what I've just been talking about and the difference between a procurement contract um, and an agreement for especially those for financial assistance, the primary goal of a contracted R&D program is to advance scientific and technical knowledge and apply that knowledge to the extent necessary to achieve agency and national goals. And there's three other bullets that I think are important, so forgive me for reading them to you, but unlike contracts for supplies and services, most R&D contracts are directed towards objectives for which the work or methods cannot be precisely described in advance. <clears throat> And you know, this is another difference that you'll probably notice right off the bat if all you've ever worked on were procurement agreements because typically um, the work, the methods, you've got milestones, everything is as uh, precise as possible to allow the contracts officer to monitor progress and to um, you know, calculate payment methodology for firm fixed price with deliverables and those kinds of things. The next bullet, difficult to judge the probabilities of success or required effort for technical approaches, some of which offer little or no early assurance of full success. And that really does go to the heart of R&D contracting because you know, you're out in you know, new areas, new approaches, leading edge, and no one can sometimes predict what's gonna be required. Um, and so the parties are trying their best to deal with those um, unknowns. The contracting process shall be used to encourage the best sources from scientific and industrial community to become involved in the program and must provide an environment in which the work can be pursued with reasonable flexibility and minimum administrative burden. And so again, on procurement contracts, contractors uh, constantly complain about administrative burden and maintaining all of the policies, procedures, internal controls, um, and showing progress to the to the government and in this case there's a little bit more flexibility and a, a, you know a spirit of cooperation typically between the government and the contractor <clears throat> next slide
work statements should include a clear description of the area of exploration. So this is a major goal um, because we, you know, the government wants to, even though there's unknowns, they want to try to define the work as much as possible. In basic research, the emphasis is on achieving specified objectives and knowledge rather than for achieving predetermined end results prescribed by a statement of specific performance. This emphasis applies particularly during the early and conceptual phases of RD um, effort. So th that's an important objective, and you're going, and that's an objective of work statements um, issued by the government. Contractors must be given freedom to exercise innovation and creativity. Contract officers are responsible for ensuring the appropriate level of effort contracting as opposed to a task completion approach that you often see in a procurement contract. To achieve the goals, the, the government objective is to provide key information in the solicitation to ensure bidders understand as much as possible the scope of the project. So some of the things that you'll see are, for example, a statement of the area of exploration, background information that's helpful in a clear understanding of the requirement, information on known constraining factors like constrained personnel use, environment, or interfaces, information about what reporting requirements are going to be required, um, the type and form of contract and the level of information of effort and information, and any other consideration the government might already know about the design or cost requirements. So it's supposed to be more of an open kimono solicitation and work statement process. Again, the reason for this is there's already enough unknowns, and so the government wants to do its best to provide as much information as it already has so that it can get a really good proposal back, or again, at least as, as, as much as is possible uh, using this kind of R&D environment. Next slide. So following along with this theme of looking at the difference between procurement and R&D contracts, in terms of contracting methods and types, we really see a big tug of war between what's preferred generally by the government, especially in uh, procurement, and what's possible given the characteristics of R&D in general. The required uh, specifications for sealed bidding, including solicitation requirements, are really difficult in R&D. But the government is still required to compl comp ah, comply with requirements of competition. Because the nature of R&D makes precise definition of goals and technical specifications difficult, the firm fixed price contract type is preferred, although sometimes it might be impossible to use, especially for larger, more complex projects. The government is nevertheless encouraged to use firm fixed price as much as possible, and you will see that typically in the later stages of the project when things, when the unknowns are kind of minimized. As a result, though, typically we'll see cost reimbursement type contracts and, and, off, and sometimes uh, cost performance incentives are included as well. The next slide. The next slide, um, solicitations. So what is the key roles and concerns of the participant in um, R&D opportunities? So I'm on slide seven. Sorry, Colton. Thank you. Okay, the contract officer goals are to decrease the time and cost of reviewing R&D proposals from sources lacking appropriate qualifications. So they don't want to receive more proposals than they need. The government prefers that the contract officer distribute solicitations to technically pre-qualified bidders. In addition to technical competence, contract officers also review management capacity, cost management experience, cost and price evaluations, and bidders should have the opportunity to understand the work statement. To that end, the FAR recommends a pre-proposal conference for negotiation. 
So what are the roles of the technical folks on the government side? They're going to be looking at factors um, related to things like present and past performance on similar work, professional experience and reputation of the bidder, relative position in their field, and the ability to acquire and retain professional and technical capabilities. And that would include like facilities, um, anything that's required to perform the work. So these, these uh, roles here sound a little bit familiar and the same with contracts officers in procurement settings. Um, so I think you're getting a little bit of a feel for the difference the differences in the collaboration um, of the two parties, the government and the contractor. Regarding contractor considerations, contractors that offer a solution that uses technology developed at private expense should be careful to protect their intellectual property. They may request negotiation with the contracts officer without the presence of competition. For example, you can take a look at FAR 15.6, the FAR also recommends this approach, and if you want to take a look, um, look at FAR 23.007. Contractors should also be careful in disclosing protected information, as these negotiations might not result in a contract. Similarly, the government may also issue requests for information or requests for exploration to research existing technologies or concepts. So they're wanting to say, does this even exist? You know, is this something we could do off the shelf? Um, is there any pre-existing technology that we could jump off of? They're just really scanning the market. So when you you look at these notices, you may or may it may or may not result in a solicitation or even a contract. So again, contractors should be careful about the information that's disclosed. Uh, the next slide. Thank you. So a word about research and development project, scientific and technical reporting. R&D contracts must require contractors to furnish scientific and technical reports that are consistent with the objectives of the effort. The purpose of the report is to create a permanent record of the work accomplished under the contract. And part of this is because taxpayer dollars are being spent. So the government wants to know, you know what has been accomplished. The reports may be shared or disclosed to other agencies or the public. So again, we're gonna have um, a re some resounding messages here related to that. One of the common sources of contention that I see between contractors and the government um, is this requirement for reporting. And also um, it, it, just even mundane issues, for example, like, uh, what is the format of the report that's required? And what is the substance of the information required? What uh, processes are required to be reported on? Just, they seem very mundane, but they can become um, a dispute. And so it's really good to get ahead of that on these projects and make sure there's common ground and a common understanding between the parties. As a result of the rights of disclosure that we talked about earlier, especially related to pre-existing contractor intellectual property, um, you wanna make sure that that's protected and you should negotiate with the contract officer for that protection of confidential proprietary and IP rights. In addition, contractors should negotiate and also adhere to their own policies regarding marketing and legend protocols on documents, um, uh, shared with the government, and if you don't have a policy or protocol, then you um, are advised to set one up and, and try to set up internal controls so that they're followed. The next slide. So this is just a little repetitive, but I wanted to kind of drive this point home because this is an area of common, um, I don't want to say disputes, but common negotiation, let's put it that way. Um, technical data rights. Protection of technical data rights is a negotiated topic that the contractors especially should look at. Um, and for more information on that, you can check out FAR Part 27. Patent rights are also covered in FAR Part 27. And then the issue of contractor and government property and title that's found in FAR Part 45. The next slide. So broad agency announcements, or BAAs, are also covered under this, sec under this part. 
BAAs are used for the acquisition of basic and applied R&D that's not related to development of a specific system or hardware. BAAs may be used by agencies to fulfill their requirements for scientific study and experimentation directed towards advancing state-of-the-art or increasing knowledge or an understanding rather than, again, a focus on a specific system or hardware solution. The BAA technique shall only be used when meaningful proposals for varying technical and scientific approaches can be reasonably anticipated. Business and academic institutions may submit projects for consideration. Next slide. So where may I find these announcements, you might be asking. If you if you wanted to check out BAAs and you might want to um, participate in this in this great program, um, this slide includes information for you so that you can look up. We've got the sites where um, BAA announcements might be found. Next slide. Okay, sorry, I'm having a little delay on the slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so the process, the proposal process for contractors um, typically includes a three-step process for BAAs. Step one is review the BAA and scope of ideas based on the requirements of the BAA. Two, draft and submit a really short idea statement to the BAA program officer as opposed to a contracts officer, and then communicate with your PO as dictated by the BAA term and governance, and then you submit your proposal. However, contractors should carefully review the BAA instructions and the agency guide, guidelines and guidance that are cited um, at, because this process, this three-step process, might vary greatly, and you don't want to be disqualified because you haven't um, followed the processes that are laid out. So the ones that I have, the processes that I have on this slide are example of BAA variations under the Air Force Research Laboratory Guide. Um, and these listed variations, again, are not all inclusive. So the, the caution here is just take a look at the instructions and follow them. And I, you know that, that's really the same as if you're working on a procurement type of, of opportunity. The next slide. So we're heading into our last topic of the day, and we're going to talk about um, a few a few points related to FFRDC provisions found in Part 35. So an FFRDC is federally funded research and development center. What is an FFRDC? Um, I've run into a lot of contractors who've been in the industry for 30 years, and they don't know what an FFRDC is. So um, at the highest level, it's a private sector entity that performs special long-term research and development projects for the government. FFRDC projects are integral to the mission and operation of the sponsoring agency. And the R&D projects are selected because they're accomplished more effectively by an FFRDC than the government's either using its in-house resources or procurement from a contractor. FFRDCs do not compete for work in the private sector. So, you know, a lot of government contractors are concerned, does an FFRDC have an, a leg up because of its relationship with the government? Um, and to avoid all those kinds of conflicts, they, are, they may not compete in, pri in private sector. Long-term relationships between the FFRDCs and the government is encouraged. As a result of, as, a, as required to complete its mission and operational work, FFRDCs have access to government resources to a much greater extent than a typical pro procurement type contractor. These resources might include supplier data, so that might be sensitive and proprietary data, employees, and installations, equipment, and real property. 
They're operated, managed, or administered by either a university or consortium of universities, an other not-for-profit or nonprofit or an industrial firm. The uh, annual ex expenditure of federal funding on the last report that um, I found, which was in 2018, uh, was a little over $21 billion per annual cycle. So there's a lot of contractors that are participating today, and so this point um, is is for you and and our contractor participants on the line. Um, FFRDCs purchase goods and services, so even though they are performing the research and development on these projects, they do purchase goods and services, including logistics and construction projects. And opportunities are found on the FFRDC website that you can take a look at, and I'll provide some information on that in a couple minutes. Um, read, again, as, as anything in government contracts, read the instructions because some FFRDCs require you to register as a potential uh, contractor before you can see the opportunities, and others simply have them publicly posted on their site. Next slide. So, FFR. DC provisions, um, I've listed out a few that are really important on the slide, um, and I want to control, I want to concentrate on just a couple of important points. A written agreement for sponsorship between the government and the FFRDC is required, and it's prepared when the FFRDC is established. So you might be asking, what in the world is a sponsor? Well, a sponsor is the executive agency that manages, administers, monitors, it basically has overall responsibility for the FFRDC. An FFRDC may have multiple agency sponsors, but there's always going to be one primary sponsor that holds that key responsibility. As a minimum, the sponsoring agreement or sponsoring agency policies and procedures, so one of those two sources, either the policies and procedures or the agreement itself, must include some major points. One, um, the statement of purpose and the mission of the FFRDC must be included. Provisions for orderly termination or renewal of the agreement. The responsibility for capitalization of the FFRDC. Identification of retained earnings or reserves and a plan for their use. And um, the major one is a prohibition against FFRDCs competing with non-FFRDC concerns in response to federal agency requests for proposals for other than operations related to the FFRDC. The term of the agreement will not exceed five years, but it can be renewed, um, and as a result, there may be periodic reviews, um, and those increments are about every, are every five years. Next slide. So we are on our last slide, um, and I hope that you found this very interesting. What I wanted to provide here is where you can find a list of all the FFRDCs if you're interested um, in learning about them, or you know, who knows, maybe working for one of them, or if you would like to be a contractor or supplier, or you want to look at solicitations. The master list is maintained by the National Science Foundation. Next slide. So on, on behalf of uh, McGuire Woods and myself, we've come to the end of our presentation and I really want to thank you for participating. I hope that this was helpful in giving you the, the, the broad view uh, and the detailed view in research and development. And if you have any other additional questions, please feel free to reach out for assistance. Thanks for a great presentation, Rose, and to our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. If you have questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.